Okay, hello. Um, so, uh, first of all, um, I wanted to give the TAs a chance to introduce themselves. Um, I see Austin. I'm assuming Anna is also here. No. Uh, we are, we are. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um why doesn't uh in alphabetical order, Austin go first, alphabetical order by last name. Austin go first and then Anna. Uh, I'll remove the spotlight on me so you can be. Uh, okay, um, I, don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to say exactly, but hey everyone, uh, my name's Austin. Um, I think uh, a lot of you are familiar faces to me from uh, previous courses, uh, so probably I'm a familiar face to a lot of you as well. Um, I, uh, I don't know, I guess I'm a third year uh, PhD student here at UCSC in the philosophy program. And um, I'm currently working on um, a project that's centered around uh, Hume, uh, who is the third uh, major figure that we'll be reading for um, this course. Um, and well, my, my work on Hume is, it's not exactly centrally related um, to the stuff that we'll be discussing specifically. Uh, in, in, in this course, which I guess has to do more with Hume's um, uh, theoretical or speculative uh, philosophy, to use the um, terms that Abe is using in the first lecture. Um, my, my work is more centered around um, what Hume calls matters of taste, um, which have to do with um, judgments that are um, sort of uh, made through or are founded in um, feelings or sentiments or passions, um, things like that. So it's, it's a slightly different topic, but it does, it does relate to the stuff that we'll be um, reading on Hume in this course. And um, I'm pretty interested in his um, philosophy as a whole, uh, as well as, um, you know, getting to know um, Locke and Barclay uh, a little bit more. So uh, I'm looking forward to um, you know, working on these uh, philosophers together with you all. Thank you. And uh, Anna? Hi. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Anna. I'm here to be uh, your TA together with Austin. Um, I'm, uh, my primary interests are in like 19th century philosophy, especially in the German tradition. Um, but I'm very happy uh, to engage with history of philosophy in general because I think um, it's just very illuminating. And of course, I needed to, to understand the 19th century. I need the, the philosophy that we are going to discuss here. So I'm very interested. Um, I want to say to you that we are deciding uh, office hours and I really want to uh, invite you to come. I'm planning to have like... Um, open office hours, we can have small groups of discussions. This is going to be completely informal. It's non-mandatory, but I encourage you to come because I think philosophy is something that we do together. So if you can talk about the material at the end of the week, raise some questions, it's going to be great. And also uh, for the end of the quarter that you need to write a final paper, and we might have some um, sections also to help you to write the paper. So it would be good if you could like maybe um, sometime show up because in the end, I think it's going to be easier to understand what it means to write a philosophical paper, to engage philosophically with the text. But as I want to say, it's just an invitation and I hope at some point you can show up. Okay, I will announce that when the time comes, that's all, okay. Okay, thank you both. Um, let's see. 
Yeah, so, um, yeah, as Anna said, I remember uh, last time I said that I was still thinking about how you were going to get feedback for the uh, partial draft of the final paper. And um, we talked about that, and it seems like the best idea is to uh, have live Zoom session uh, sections just that one time. Um, and uh, will be optional to come to that, but it would, you know, be uh, a great way to discuss your ideas for your paper with your TA and or with uh, other students. So, um, so I want to, uh, as Anna just did, I want to encourage you to go to that when the time comes and also uh, to visit the TAs in office hours and I'm going to announce my office hours soon. I just have to get the rest of my schedule settled and then I'll announce my office hours. Um, are there any questions about the syllabus or assignments or anything like that before I start the rest of the lecture? Okay, so I'm going to just start talking about Locke. Um, I wonder if I teach this course often enough whether I'll get their name, their dates memorized <laughs> and not have to look in Wikipedia every year. Well, or just look at my old notes every year. But anyway, um, yeah, so those are his dates. Um, I'm only going to say a little bit about his biography. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm really, I'm not a historian. Um, I'm very interested in the history of philosophy, but uh, which certainly the longer you stay with it, pulls you more into other stuff, details about the lives of these people and what happened in the world at the time they were alive. But I kind of have to be dragged into that piece by piece. I'm really more interested in what they say in their book and what their um, arguments are and so forth. But so I'm just, I'll just say a little bit about it. If you were in 144 last quarter, you probably almost heard almost the same thing from me then, but um, I don't think that's very many of you. So anyway, um, uh, early on he studied medicine um, at Oxford, um, and he actually practiced medicine for a while. Um, his, um, also, while he was at Oxford, he was involved with a group of what we'd now call natural scientists. They call themselves experimental philosophers. Um, the center of that group was Boyle and Hooke, but Locke was a, you know, kind of young, uh, associate of that. Um, so, you know, when you see him later, later talking about chemistry experiments and things like that, he's talking about stuff that he's actually done. Um, although he was not a major contributor to the history of chemistry or anything like that. Um, after that, he, I mean, not including every detail, well, not even including every detail I know, let alone every detail. <laughs> um, he went on to work for the Earl of Shaftesbury. Um, and uh, so this part is less important in this course than it is in 144, but I'm still going to discuss it a little bit. And well, maybe you'll see why in a second. So, um, so he first worked for Shaftesbury as a physician, um, but then later he worked for him as his secretary. Um, so this, I mean, being Shaftesbury's secretary had a couple of consequences. One consequence was that in the run up to the so-called glorious revolution of 1688, um, which was the, when they replaced James II with uh, William and Mary, um, Shaftesbury was on the anti-King side and Locke was also involved in that. And 
um, he ended up having to flee to, to live in Amsterdam for a few years for safety's sake. And that was actually where he wrote probably most of this book, although he didn't publish it until he was back in England in 1689 after the revolution. Um, but the other consequence of his being a secretary uh, for Shaftesbury is that earlier, when Shaftesbury was still in favor with the king, at that time was Charles II, uh, he was made one of the Lord's proprietor of the colony of Carolina. Right? It's called Carolina because it's named after Charles II. <laughs> um, so, um, and uh, Locke therefore became a secretary to the Lord's proprietor of Carolina. And among other things, what that meant is that he ended up writing a constitution for the colony of Carolina. Now, this constitution never really went into effect, but it's um, notorious anyway, because mostly because it, um, it only mentions this in a couple of places, but it enshrines slavery in the constitution of Carolina. So Locke was involved in that by way of of this constitution writing that he did. Now, um, it also enshrined some other bad stuff like hereditary serfdom, uh, things that Locke certainly didn't think were a good idea um, or were permissible or whatever, but nevertheless, it's, it, it raises complicated questions about Locke. Like I said, ones that will come up more in 144, but we definitely wanna keep in mind here too. Um, um, what else do I want to say about him? So in 60, so when he came back to England, he published close, very close to each other, um, his major work on politics, which we read in 144, the two treatises on government, and then this book, the essay concerning human understanding. Um, and he's very famous for both of them. Um, he's famous, but, and I don't know, how to put this exactly, but um, he has a kind of, well, he has kind of two bad parts of his reputation. He has a reputation for either being not too bright as philosophers go or as great philosophers go, if you want to say that, and also a reputation of being kind of nasty in some way. Um, maybe not with exactly the same audience, but it would overlapping groups of people have that impression of him. Um, I really don't agree with either of those. Um, I actually, the more I've taught him over the last several years, the more I started, um, <laughs> well, someone said we have to burn his book. Yeah, please. Uh, don't just don't burn the ebook. That would be uh, that would be dangerous. Um, so um, yeah, I don't agree with either of those. The thing I just mentioned about slavery could obviously could form part of the nasty story, um, but uh, but worse than that, he defends private property. So from some people's point of view, that's also terrible. Um, uh, in any case, um, yeah, I don't. I don't agree either that he's not too bright or that he's kind of nasty. He, he, I really actually kind of respect him more and more as time goes on. So, um, you know, I mean, I'm going to try to explain why what he says makes sense. Not, of course, to explain why it's right. Um, uh, you know, as Descartes pointed out, uh, you couldn't possibly assume that philosophers are right because they don't agree with each other. So they can't all be right. And in fact, most of them must be wrong. <laughs> uh, so if you think you should only read philosophers who are right, that's going to mean that there's like at most one. <laughs> um, but, uh, but in fact, uh, they're all wrong, right? I mean, uh, all important philosophers are wrong. We don't read them because they're right. We ask read them because, um, well, number one, because they raise interesting questions. They raise good questions and they give interesting answers to them, even if it's not the right answer. 
And number two, because if we're trying to understand how we ourselves think, which is ultimately what philosophy is like, then we need to understand where we came from. <laughs> so for both of those reasons, it's uh, um, not necessary to defend a historical philosopher as being right about everything or anything, but it is desirable to defend them as being interesting, not silly, foolish, uh, evil, or whatever. Um, okay, and I guess there's only one other general thing I wanted to say about Locke, which is what I meant to say at the end last time, and I ran out of time, which is about his writing style. And I'll just try to say this quickly, but I mean, so this is the oldest of the three philosophers we're reading, obviously. And therefore, you know, the farthest away from the way we write and speak English. Things have changed a certain amount. Um, not just that certain words have changed meaning a little bit and whatever, but also that like expectations about, like feelings about what is a good way of writing have changed. So um, like we're, used to thinking that the best way of writing is to be really um, vivid and to the point and, um, uh, you know, grab your reader's attention, uh, have some short forceful sentences, whatever. It used to be, and this idea goes back to Cicero and they still to some extent feel this way in German, but not really in English that the best way of writing was thought to be that every sentence would be kind of like a long, elegant puzzle <laughs> that you would have to like take apart and put back together again. And that's what Locke's sentences are like. And it takes some getting used to. Um, he's very good at it, I think. So in other words, it's not that he's a bad writer. He's good at the kind of writing he's doing, but it's not exactly the kind we're used to. Um, he also has some characteristics that are maybe unique to him. He's long-winded in certain ways. He really likes to beat an argument into the ground. So as we saw like already in the reading from book one, like if he has an opponent who says X because of Y, then he'll say, well, first of all, Y is false. And second of all, X is false. And second and third of all, even if X were true, Y wouldn't follow from it, <laughs> right? So he'll like hit everything he could, <laughs> um, not just say enough to show that they're wrong. Um, that's his style. They probably, there's good reasons for it. If the more interesting a philosopher is, the more I feel that if you think about it, you'll understand why they write the way they do. But in any case, that also may take some getting used to, although it should help you that I'm only assigning like a third of this book. So, I mean, that means, unfortunately, we're skipping some good important parts, but also we're skipping some parts that are kind of skippable. <laughs> okay, um, so are there any gen general questions about Locke? Someone says in the chat, you can only read Hegel because even if he's wrong, you won't be able to figure out how. Actually, it's easy to figure out that Hegel is wrong because he says stuff like the sun isn't hot and tape forms are spontaneously generated in the intestines. It's a false theory that we swallow the eggs and there are only seven planets. <laughs> um, water isn't composed of hydrogen and oxygen. Yeah, um, it's it's actually it's it's hard to figure out why he <laughs> he's wrong. <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, sorry. So, are there general general questions about Locke? Okay. So, if not, I'm just going to go into talking about. Um, so this is kind of a general introduction to what I need to talk about in book one and book two. This is about propositions versus ideas. Now, by the way, I should say something about book one, which is that um, 
in most editions of Locke, book one, and including the early editions that he himself supervised, book one has four chapters. The first chapter is called Introduction. The second chapter is called No Innate Speculative Principles. The third is No Innate Practical Principles. And the fourth is Further Considerations. In some editions of Locke, including the wiki source one that I have a link to on the syllabus, the introduction is its own thing. It's not part of book one and book one only has three chapters. So I hope that didn't trip anyone up. I should have mentioned it last time. Um, you know, the section, the um, chapter, and section, the chapter numbers on the syllabus refer to the way where book one has four chapters, which should have been clear at least when you got to the ones from chapter four of book one. Um, all right, but so anyway, going back to this, propositions versus ideas. So um, it's probably easiest to start explaining this by writing up an example. So here's an example, snow is white. This is an example of a proposition. Now, uh, Locke actually says, this is towards the beginning of book four. He doesn't say this here, but he says uh, there, uh, there are two types of, pro oh, okay, this camera is frozen. Back camera. I don't know why this happens. There we go. Oh, so you didn't see when I wrote his dates up there, but I didn't write anything else. I just wrote his name and dates. All right. And I just, so just now I wrote propositions versus ideas and I wrote snow is white. This is a proposition. Um, Locke says, as I said, towards the beginning of book four is where he says this, there are two types of propositions, mental propositions and verbal propositions. So, you know, I mean, I guess, Literally speaking, what I wrote here is a verbal proposition, right? It's certain marks that are signs of something. We'll see how Locke thinks that works in book three. But, um, but it's important because what it's a sign of is a mental proposition, which is, you know, like when I think that snow is white. So that's the type of proposition that we're mostly interested in mental propositions. So the mental proposition snow is white means, you know, like thinking snow is white. And according to Locke, the way propositions like this work is that they assert a certain relation between ideas. So in this proposition, there are two ideas, the idea of snow and the idea of white. Now, some of Locke's examples appear to have more than two ideas, um, but when he discusses it in general, he usually assumes that they have two. And this is definitely an example that has two. One of them is the subject and the other is the predicate. Um, um, so a proposition, sometimes he says is, made up out of ideas, it contains ideas, it relates ideas to each other. In this case, I relate the idea of snow to the idea of white. And I say that, you know, whatever this idea is about, this idea applies to it or something like that. Um, these two ideas, Locke doesn't say this too much, but he does say it at an important point in this reading. So I mean, these two ideas that the proposition relates can be called the terms. Terms means like ends. It's the two ends of the proposition <laughs> are the two terms. Um, Right, so the terms of this proposition are snow and white. Um, 
Right, so let me, you know, let me make it clear. This whole thing is a proposition, and this is an idea, and this is an idea. Um, idea is a word that Locke uses constantly, right? The first uh, part of the reading from book one was that one section where he apologizes for using it so much and says what little he can about what he means by it. But so it's really important. I mean, idea is also a word that in uh, actually not just in English, but in all philosophical languages has been used in a lot of different ways. And certainly in contemporary English is used in all kinds of vague ways, right? So for example, it wouldn't sound funny if I said the idea that snow is white, right? We could call that an idea too. But Locke would not call that an idea. He calls that a proposition. He reserves ideas for the things that propositions can be about, roughly speaking. So the purpose of this whole book is to ask, well, I guess really two closely related questions. One is, what is the basis that all our knowledge rests on? Where does it come from? And therefore, uh, what are the limits of our knowledge? So again, using the, the uh, word I used last time, it's about epistemology. Where does our knowledge come from and how much of it therefore can we have? But knowledge consists in or is about propositions, right? This is the kind of thing you can know. You can know that snow is white. What does it mean according to Locke to, to say that you, I know that snow is white? Um, if I knew that, actually Locke is gonna say, I don't really know that. I only can make a probable judgment about it. But suppose I knew that snow is white. So according to Locke, that would mean that, um, first of all, I assent to that proposition. Right, I think that proposition is true. And number two, I can be certain that it's true. So this is, a, this is actually is a pretty strong condition for something to count as knowledge. It has to be something, and when I say can be certain, that means um, um, there must, I must know some rational, rationally convincing reason to believe that it's true. Absolutely convincing. That's what the certainty consists in. Right? So it's probably not surprising once you define knowledge that way to hear that there's a lot of things that we ordinarily think we know that Locke is going to say we don't exactly know. Like, for example, that snow is white. Um, um, there are other things that he'll say that we do know, like one plus one equals two. <laughs> um, but the anyway, the point in this context is that uh, um, however much we do or don't know, the things we know are propositions, not ideas. So the answer to those two interlocking questions, the interlocking answer to both of them is going to be, we already know it's given away by the title of the course, <laughs> empiricism, right? The basis of our knowledge is experience. And the things we can know about are the things you can know about by experience. That's the limit. Now, this, this kind of, there's kind of an exception to, not an exception, but there's kind of a limit to how strictly Locke means that. And I will not go into that now though, but that's the basic answer. So the competitor to Locke's answer. So maybe, yeah, I, I don't want to erase my proposition. I'm gonna say, you know, What is the basis of knowledge? It's 
So we have lost in this is experience. And then we have the competitor that he considers, and he only considers one competitor. And the competitor is that the basis of our knowledge is innate principles. Right, so innate principles means um, that there's certain things that we're born knowing that are the foundation of all our knowledge. Um, born knowing means uh, it means something pretty strong. I used to sometimes say it means that we're thinking about them at the instant we were born and we're always thinking about them. I think maybe that's a little bit too strong, but it at least means that every time we think about them after we're born, we remember them. We remember having thought them before. Um, so um, so even though we didn't, they didn't have our attention the whole time since we were born until now, in that sense, we've known them since we were born. We didn't learn them later. So um, that's the alternative he, he's considering. It's not clear that it's the only possible inter alternative, but that's the one he considers. And so book one is basically about this. Book one is about why that competitive theory is wrong and why the arguments that seem to support it don't work. And then the other three books are about Locke, right? So this is book one. And this is book two through four. Um, and Locke actually says that this would be sufficient, right? That he could have just started arguing for his answer. Um, because he says the burden of proof is on the other side, right? That is, if I can show that um, we could have got all our knowledge from experience, then um, um, uh, there's no reason to suppose that we need innate principles. We could get it from experience. So he says that actually this positive argument for his view is enough. But again, as I said about his style, he's very thorough. So before he gives the positive argument for his view, he tries to undermine the other two. Now, so that's the structure of the book as a whole. Um, but um, what that means is, and I feel like this is confusing, although I wonder whether what I do with it isn't also confusing. But anyway, what's confusing is that this book, therefore, is basically about propositions, right? Innate principles, I just said, they're things that you would be born knowing. So again, the kind of things you can know are propositions. Now, it's not going to be a proposition like snow is white. It's going to be something more fundamental than that. But in any case, it's going to be a proposition that you're born knowing. So this book is basically about propositions. Does it make sense to say that we're born knowing certain propositions? And he does then from that go back, especially in chapter four of book one and say, well, what about the ideas that are in those propositions? But um, at that point, he still hasn't discussed ideas in general. He doesn't start talking about ideas, which again are according to him what propositions are made out of until the beginning of book two. So it's kind of the opposite order. And so uh, therefore when I lecture about it, I like to lecture about the beginning of book two first and then assuming I don't want enough time <laughs> to lecture about book one after that. Um, Okay, so there are questions, other questions about propositions versus ideas, about innate principles. Okay, no questions so far. Only a couple of, oh, this. 
Oh, sounds good to me. All right. <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to give you some feedback. That's that's nice. <laughs> some feedback is better than none. All right. So um, so therefore, I'm going to start talking about the beginning of book two, which book two, the whole subject of book two is ideas. So to explain what Locke means by idea, um, it's useful to start with a general picture about how um, the mind works according to Locke and actually in a sense an even more general principle about how things work in general. This remember is part of what I was talking about last time his metaphysics. And the important distinction I want to talk about first is the distinction between a power and an operation. This also sometimes he calls a faculty. And he may use other terms as well sometimes, but those are the main ones. So what's the relation between a power and an operation? Well, so I could just start with an example. So let's maybe I should have left more room here, but over here I'm going to put something like a fire. So um, a fire has a power to burn things. We call it the power of burning. But of course, it's not always actually burning something. Right? So this is potential. That's potentia is the Latin word for that is being translated here as power. It's a translation of the Greek word dunamis. Right, so um, so this the the but the but the fire has a power of burning means it's potentially burning, but it doesn't mean that it's actually burning. Now suppose we bring a piece of wood up to the fire and it starts to burn it. So then it's like actually burning. Something. Yeah, unfortunately, burn, like many verbs in English, is both transitive and intransitive. So this is a little bit uh, ambiguous. But I mean, the power of burning is something. So here's an, another example. Here's the wood. You could both kind of do this example. So anyway, here's the wood. It has a power to be burnt. So this is what's traditionally called and what Locke calls an active power. This is a passive power. It has the power to be burnt. So the wood is sitting there. It's not being burnt now, but it's potentially being burnt. It has a power to be burnt. When we bring the fire up to it, then the fire actually starts to burn it and it starts to be burnt. And then it's actually being burnt. Right, so you can call this the fire's operation of burning something. When it's actually burning something and doesn't just, not just sitting there with the power inside it, so to speak, to burn something, it's, it's carrying out the operation of burning something. That way sounds pretty natural, I guess, but Locke is also going to use operation in this case, right? When the wood is being burnt, it's carrying out, so to speak, but it's passive, right? It's something that's happening to it, not something it's doing, but it, it's undergoing the operation of being burnt. In both cases, the operation is when the power, as they say traditionally, passes into act, becomes actual and no longer just potential. 
Okay, so so far I'm talking about fire and wood. I haven't brought the mind into this at all. Is are there questions about this so far? Okay, so now let me bring the mind into it. So um, I'm sorry, this up here. Uh, is it a good idea? Now I'm going to have to erase this to make enough room up here. Uh, no, maybe not. All right. This is me. And this is a snowball. And suppose, well, I didn't draw myself close enough to the snowball here to make my arm long. I suppose I'm seeing and feeling the snowball. Um, so the snowball, here's the snowball but again down here, right? has certain powers. Um, one of its powers is the power to cause me to see white under the proper circumstances, right? Obviously, if the lights are off, I'll see black, but uh, under the proper circumstances, the snowball has the power to cause me to see white. So let me just call it like the power to look white. No, maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I should write it out. To make me see white. And similarly, I won't write it here because there's no room on the board, but it also has a power to make me feel cold. Now it has those powers even when it's in a box and I'm somewhere else, right? Again, this is a matter of potential versus action. It has the power to cause that, but it's not causing it now because I'm not looking at it, whatever. But, um, um, of course, when I do look at it, and I do feel it, it carries out an operation that actually makes me see light. And this power to make me see light, first of all, is an active power. Right, it's something the snowball is doing to me. And second of all, it's what Locke calls the kind of power Locke calls equality. Right, so when Locke says the snowball has a quality of whiteness, he means the snowball has the power to cause me and other human beings to see white. That is, under the proper circumstances, when I look at it and the light is on and whatever, it will actually make me see white. And then lastly, here's me again down here. So I have a power. Now, I'm going to describe this power a lot more generally than I did this power, although it also has its, all its specific parts, I guess. But um, Call this the power to sense. Right, or as Locke would call it, the faculty and a lot of other philosophers too, the faculty of sensation. Remember, faculty is another word for power. I have a faculty of sensation. I have a power to sense things. Again, I have that power even, well, if there were such a time, if I weren't sensing anything, I would still have that power. But now you bring the snowball to where I can see it and I touch it with my hand and circumstances are right. And then I actually sense. And I actually sense, for example, So now in me is an operation of sensation. 
and it's specifically an operation of sensing white. So, and so notice this is a passive power, right? I, I don't make myself see white. The snowball makes me see it. And if my eyes are open and the lights are on, whatever, I can't help seeing it. It's not something I'm doing. It's something the snowball's doing to me. The snowball causes me to carry out or undergo this operation of seeing whiteness in the same way the fire causes the wood to carry out or undergo the operation of being burnt. Okay, so that's the that's the basic overall picture of how the mind works. But I haven't mentioned ideas yet. And obviously to get ideas in, I'm gonna to have to erase what's on the board. So are there questions about what's on the board before I erase it? I mean, this is a pretty widespread scheme. It derives from Aristotle ultimately. Um, so you'll find it in many, many other philosophers, not just Locke. Um, what I'm about to describe now is the specific thing Locke says about our mental faculty, and in particular, our mental faculty of perception. So, um, Right, so this um, power or faculty of sensation is, as I just said, Locke considers it to be a mental faculty, right? So, um, so should I have drawn like my body here or should I have just drawn my mind? Now, I mean, if this were Descartes, this would, that would be a really important question. Um, because Descartes claims to prove in the meditations and other places that my mind and my body are two completely different things, either of which could exist without the other. Locke, in this book, says that he doesn't really have to resolve whether that's the case or not. He says that all the things he's going to say, except for ex occasional excursions into natural philosophy, all the things he's going to say don't depend on whether I think that my mind is a part or an aspect of my body or is a separate thing that's kind of attached to my body somehow. So, um, so basically, for Locke, for Locke's purposes, you can you can you can draw the picture either way. But, it, but whether this is an operation of something that's not my body or of my body itself, it's a mental operation, right? It's an operation of me insofar as I'm a thinking being. Okay, so from now on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw my mind. But again, my mind may not be any different from my body, or I mean, it may just be an aspect or a part of my body or whatever. Um, so my mind has certain faculties. One of them, like we said, is the faculty of sensation. So let me draw the snowball back in again. The snowball has this quality. That is power of whiteness. So what is that the power to do? Well, it's the power to make me carry out this operation. And this operation is the type of operation this is of my mind is sensation. Right? Sensation is the type of operation that my mind carries out when I perceive an external thing, like a snowball. Okay. 
but um, now comes the tricky part. So this operation is different from the operation of being burnt in an important way. The operation of being burnt is not about something. Right? Like it's not about the fiber. Well, maybe you can think of it that way. I mean, for, like for example, for sure Leibniz will think of it that way, but uh, but for the most part, we don't think of the wood as representing the fire by being burnt. Right? The wood fire is not burnt, the wood is not being burnt about the fire. But this operation of sensation is the operation of sensing something. Now, let me not draw the whole line. <laughs> that, that, that's, the, that's the key point. Where do you stop the line? It's an operation of sensing something. Right, so so far we have the faculty, which is the power. We have the operation. And now the operation has what's called an object. Right? Uh, many type of mental operations have objects. They're about something, they aim at something. So not just sensation, right? Like I can desire something, then that thing is the object of my desire. In this case, when I sense something, that thing is the object of my sensation. That's the traditional philosophical use of the term object, and that's how Locke always uses it, right? There's other ways we use object now. Like I could say, you know, oh, I'm holding some kind of object in my hand, and it's just a synonym for thing or something like that, but Locke does not use it that way. Locke uses object in the sense where when you call something an object, you mean it's an object of what? And basically, it's an object of some operation. Or you could call it an object of the faculty of which, which that would be an operation, right? So I could call it an object of sense because it could be the object of the sensation. But the question is, what is the object? of the operation of sensation. And according to Locke, there are two different answers to that. So this is what's, for obvious reasons, sometimes called the double object theory of perception. There's an immediate object. And then there's a media that. Locke uses this phrase a lot more than he uses this phrase, but they imply each other, as you can see. Right? If one of them is immediate, the other one is immediate. What does immediate mean? Immediate just means that it means by means of something, by the medium of something. Right, something goes in between. If X is related to Y immediately, it means there's something that goes between X and Y to make the relation go. Whereas immediate means there's nothing that is nothing of a certain kind in between X and Y. So in this case, X is the operation. And if Y is this immediate one, then there's no other object between the operation and this. So it's the immediate object. I'm emphasizing somewhat what immediate means here because I know, like, again, you know, we have our uses for this word in contemporary English. When you say do something immediately, it's really the same word, right? It means don't do anything else in between. Right, to do it immediately would be to do something else first, so to speak, right? But, but when Locke is using it here, he's not talking about time, right? What, there's no other object in between the operation and this object. Whereas this object, there is another one in between. 
the operation has this object only by means by the medium of this immediate. And this immediate object is what Locke calls an idea. As for what the immediate object is, I think sometimes Locke says, as we would normally say, you know, what I sense is the snowball. So the immediate object, the external object that I sense by means of this idea is the snowball. But other times, and I think he thinks of this as more strictly speaking true, he'll say that the immediate object is the quality. Right, so by sensing this idea, and in this case, let's say it's the idea of white. By having this idea of white as the immediate object of my sensation, I'm able immediately to sense the quality of whiteness that is in the snowball. Right, so these different dotted lines stand for different things. This one here is causation. The snowball, by way of its quality, causes me to carry out this operation. It causes me to see white, which means it causes me to have this operation of sensation whose immediate object is white. There's a kind of whiteness inside my mind that's the object of my operation of sensation. But it was the external thing that caused me to have the operation of sensation, right? So that's why this line goes all the way across here. Then what I sense is immediately just that idea. But by way of it, I sense the quality that caused me to perceive the idea. Okay. Are there questions about that? Don't you require a medium to sense such as the eye? Okay, that's that's a good point. So I mean, uh, of course, uh, if I were to draw me back here, here's the eye. So I can't see the snowball unless the snowball, by its that, by its quality of whiteness here, affects my eye. Um. However, it's not enough for the snowball to affect my eye for me to see white, right? Like if the optic nerve is cut or if I'm unconscious, um, right? If other things go wrong between the eye and something, my mind somehow, I still won't see white, right? So the eye is according to Locke as according to Descartes, just part of the story of how the snowball affects me, um, right? So, I mean, it doesn't affect me by being in my mind and making this happen. It affects me actually, I mean, we'll see that Locke thinks there's only one way this kind of thing can happen at a distance, which is there must be small particles traveling between the snowball and me. So there's particles of light that bounce off the snowball, bounce into my eye, hit my retina, wiggle my nerves, wiggle stuff in my brain. Um, and then because of that, I perceive the idea of light. Is that, is that answering the question you were asking? So, I mean, I guess if you were to say like, is this relation here immediate? The answer is no, and moreover, like bodies never act immediately on each, on each other at a distance. There's always have to be other th things pushing other things in between. Um, okay. All right. So, um, so there, obviously, the mind has quite a few of these faculties or powers, depending on how you count, how you count them. But um, Locke is going to divide them into two, as opposed to Hume, which Austin mentioned at the beginning, who divides them into three, I think. Locke is going to 
divide them into two basic kinds, which are called plot and volition. This also is a very uh, old traditional philosophical class classification of mental powers. Um, and it's roughly speaking related to that speculative practical distinction that I introduced last time. So, um, right, so thought is overall is the power of um, considering things with a view towards knowing the truth. Um, whereas volition overall is the power of considering things with a view to determining what to do, right? So this includes will and desire and other stuff like that. Um, now, uh, but loss includes sensation under the body. Right, I mean, this might not sound so natural to us. And actually in one place, Locke says that it's really not exactly proper, that thought should really be used for the, only the higher faculties and not for sensation. But for the most part, he includes sensation in, in this overall classification under thought. So uh, let me erase some of this. So we have thought. And one type of thought is perception. So these are, right, this is a, an overall power or faculty. Now I'm giving it's kind of sub power or sub faculty. That also means that I'm giving a subtype of operation. Some operations of thought are operations of, of perception. Other operations of thought are of other kinds which we'll learn more about later. And perception has two kinds, sensation, which I've just been talking about, and reflection. At least this is one of the ways he uses perception. He may use it in a more general way as well. I think he does use it in a more general way as well. Right here he uses, I think, am I even right about this? I think he uses perception in this context to include only sensation and reflection. And so perception in that sense, where it's either sensation or reflection, is, so to speak, the first operation of thought. Now, I mean, you can kind of see that in one way because if thought is ultimately going to try to build up propositions and come to know them with certainty or whatever, it's going to have to start with ideas. And these are operations that have ideas as their object. So um, in that sense, these are first, but also the doctrine of empiricism, what it basically means for Locke is that the only way we get, now you have to be careful about how you say this, but the only way you get the material that all our ideas are made, ultimately gonna be made up of is by these two operations of sensation and reflection. So for example, after having seen a snowball and a black horse, I may be able to form the idea of a white horse, even though I've never seen one. But all the ideas that go into that idea of a white horse, I, I ultimately got from sensation or reflection, depending on how you think, what you think the idea of a horse is. All right, but anyway, um, um, so that's what sensation is. It's the power of perceiving external things. It's a passive power. Right, that is, it's the power for external things to cause me to perceive ideas, and by way of those ideas, I perceive them. Now, my daughter just wrote something. I wrote hi. Oh, okay. hi. Oh. <laughs> um, so, um, what about reflection? What is reflection? So, it's important to get this right, I think. 
even though I'm aware that some people interpret Locke differently, I think they're wrong. So <laughs> it's, it's important to get it right, meaning to agree with me. Well, uh, no, I mean, I'm telling you other people disagree with me because maybe in the end you'll think I'm wrong, but this is, this is the way it seems to me. Reflection, so first of all, reflection is a kind of sensation um, only rather than being the sensation of external objects, it's like an, a kind of sensation of our own mind. So let me switch to the document here now for the first time and show you this. This is book two, chapter one, section four on page 110. And is that in focus? Okay. This source of ideas every man has wholly in himself. And though it be not sense, as having nothing to do with external objects, yet it is very like it and might properly enough be called internal sense. But as I call the other sensation, so I call this reflection, right? So sensation, so reflection is like sensation, only in some way its object is my own mind rather than an external object. Now, so this is the part that's important to get. In some way, what does that mean? Well, in a certain sense, even in the case of sensation, the object is in my own mind, right? These ideas are in my mind. The idea of whiteness is like the appearance of whiteness that's in my mind, something like that, roughly speaking. That's what I immediately see, according to this view. It's inside my mind, but of course, in this case, the immediate object, which is the cause of me perceiving that idea, is outside my mind, it's in this moment. So how does reflection work? So Locke says, in the case of reflection, the object is an operation of my own mind. How do I have the operation of my own mind as an object? By way of an idea. So this operation of my own mind has the power to get me to perceive itself. In the same way the snowball has a power to get me to perceive it. Right now I'm acting on myself. <laughs> my own operation which is the operation of the passive power of sensation itself has the power to get me to carry out this other operation of reflection. When circumstances are right, for example, I have to be paying attention, which Locke says at, when we're young, we mostly don't, like when we're infants. When you face away from the microphone, your volume drops pretty dramatically. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I wonder if it's using the right microphone. Hmm. What happens if I use that one? So like right now it's fine, but I understand what the other person I was talking about it's when you're uh, when you step away or in, in front of the board so you might want to yes. try that then. what about now then I can tell you is this better yeah yeah okay because I'm there's two cameras so there's two webcams I should use the mic in this one <laughs> all right um okay sorry um so uh
Right. So the point is that reflection works just like sensation, except that the object is in operation of my own mind. Works just like sensation means it's still mediated by an idea. This, at least part of this idea, is what Locke calls the idea of perception, which he's going to discuss later, right? He says that's a simple idea, just like the idea of whiteness. Um, so, um, so what's important here, among other things, is that the object of reflection is not this idea. It's this operation. How do I perceive this idea? Well, this operation is the perception of this idea, <laughs> right? So like the idea of whiteness, how do I know that there's an idea of whiteness in my mind? The operation of sensation by which I sense whiteness is the operation by which I know that there's an idea of whiteness in my mind. I don't need reflection for that and reflection can't get to that. Reflection uses its own idea and allows me to represent this operation of perception itself. Um, okay, I should, could say more about that, but I'm way behind what I thought my schedule would be. But I will still stop, stop for questions. Um, I just had a question on what the word um, next to perception is under thought. Oh, that just says et cetera. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. Right, <laughs> there's perception is one of the, the sub parts of the faculty of thought and then there's other parts we haven't got to yet. Okay. Yeah, I know that my my writing on the board can be difficult to read. So if don't hesitate to ask me if you can't read something. <laughs> also, if I if I show you a piece or read a piece of text and you didn't catch where it is, don't hesitate to ask me where it was. Um, last quarter we had someone who voluntarily like would supply the quotes as I read them, but. Uh, I think Alvaro's with us this quarter, so I don't know if anyone's going to do that. Okay. <laughs> so, Alana's waiting here to write something else on the board, I think, but I don't know what. <laughs> Oh, just try again. All right. Um, so, uh, oh, under idea, yeah, it said of white. Yeah, sorry, it's gone now, but that's what it said. Okay, um, so maybe she's trying to demonstrate that she can write better than I can. Um, so I just, I do want to get on to book one. So, and this is something we're going to come back to. So maybe I'm just going to discuss it quickly, which is the classification of ideas. Yes, is your handwriting better? Well, it's kind of small though. Yeah. Yes. So um, there's a number of ways of classifying ideas. Um, Locke eventually is going to discuss quite a few of them. But there's two that are really important to begin with. One is simple versus complex. And the other is particular versus abstract. 
Now, uh, the whole structure of book two is built around that first one, simple versus complex. Um, this one is going to come up more later, although he does start discussing it already in book one as part of his argument against his opponents. So um, this one is pretty easy to understand, I think. Like if you were to take uh, uh, the idea of a snowball, for example. Well, a snowball is something that has various different qualities, what we call a snowball. <laughs> is high the immediate or the immediate? Yeah, I don't know. Um, so um, a snowball, what we call a snowball, is something that has various different properties. It's white, it's cold, and it has other properties, whatever. Um, so the idea of a snowball, this is the way Locke thinks about it, has to contain various ideas. So, you know, when we think about a snowball, we're thinking about the thing that has all of those qualities. When we perceive a snowball, we're, you know, sensing the ideas that correspond to at least some of those qualities, and we're, you know, guessing or inferring that the others are there too. So in either case, the idea of snowball is the one that contains all those ideas together. The idea of whiteness, the idea of coldness, Here's the idea of snowball. And it contains these pieces, white, cold, and others. Now, I mean, you can have more complex ideas than that. For example, if suppose we wanted to form the idea of a snowball fight, So the idea of a snowball fight involves, among other things, the idea of a snowball, right? That is, oops, this is not focus now. Right, so the idea of a snowball fight contains the idea of snowball. That is, when you think about a snowball fight, you're thinking, among other things, about snowballs. Plus, it contains other stuff, like the idea of a fight, <laughs> whatever. Um, so, uh, so you can break down the idea of a fight into the idea of a snowball and other ideas. And then if you focused on the idea of a snowball, you could break that down into white and cold and other ideas. Um, but Locke thinks you couldn't keep doing that forever. At some point, it has to bottom out in ideas that don't have other ideas contained in them, and those are the simple ideas. So in particular, white and cold and other um, sensory ideas like that are always Locke always considers as examples to be examples of simple ideas right so he says the idea of white is not composed of other ideas that you think of in order to think of white it's just this one thing and it can't be divided further so that's the easier distinction and also like i said the one that's going to get a lot more attention um at least in the near term the other one, which is harder, um, I'm just going to give an example of it, which is like, so there's this snowball here. So like, for example, what I'm perceiving, if I perceive a snowball is, here's my mind, is this snowball here. So I have the idea of 
this snowball. That's a particular idea. But then somehow I can take that idea apart and abstract really is the same word as subtract. Abstract means like to take off, right? So I can take that idea apart, get rid of or ignore the parts that are particular to this snowball here and consider only the parts of that idea that, that, are, sh that are shared by all snowballs in general. So by abstraction, this is still in my mind, <laughs> I can arrive at an idea of snowball in general. And that's an example of an abstract idea. So according to Locke, abstract ideas are crucial to our ability to understand language, to think general truths about the world, to do mathematics. Um, you know, and moreover, he says that's the distinctive human ability that we have over other animals is the ability to form abstract ideas. Barclay, as we'll see, is going to say there's no such thing as an abstract idea, and this is all a bunch of mumbo jumbo. <laughs> but we'll discuss that when we get to it. So as long as we're with Locke, these abstract ideas are really important. Um, and the only thing I want to say about it now is that um, there's a kind of unclarity from the very beginning. I think it's an unclarity that can be resolved, but I think I shouldn't try to resolve it now. Um, but there's a kind of unclarity from the very beginning. What kind of ideas do we get first? So this picture makes it look like we get particular ideas first. And then only by abstraction do we get abstract ideas? And that is Locke's view. So he says, right, at first, you know, babies only have particular ideas. They gain the ability to abstract later on, um, etc. But on another hand, he also says that what we first get from the senses are simple ideas. And the reason that's troubling is that it might seem like so white is an example of a simple idea. So this idea of snowball in general, it contains white and cold and whatever. But sub suppose I abstract further and I take out everything that this idea doesn't have in common with a marshmallow and um, a piece of paper and my whiteboard and uh, um, all the other things that are white, then I would be left with a very, very abstract idea, which would be the idea of whiteness. So it seems like the simple idea should come last, according to this picture. But Locke also says that no, actually the senses take in simple ideas to begin with. So when we get to Locke's discussion of complex ideas and abstraction uh, in particular, we'll have to go back to that and try to figure out what's going on. Um, but for now, I want to go on and spend at least 10 minutes talking about innate principles, unless there are questions. OK. So um, okay, so first of all, what is an innate principle or what would be an innate principle if there were any? But Locke says there aren't any. Um, 
Well, so an innate principle, like I said, would be a proposition. that we know from birth. So an innate principle is not an innate, an innate idea. It's an innate proposition. However, of course, propositions are composed of ideas. So one of Locke's arguments um, and it's the one he makes in chapter four or chapter three, according to the other division of book one, is that um, he says there are no innate ideas, evidently, and therefore there can't be innate principles. Right? That makes sense. If a proposition consists of an idea of ideas, and I'm supposed to know the proposition since I was born, then I better also have those ideas that are in the proposition, that are related in the proposition since I was born. So if the principle is it is impossible for the same thing to be and not to be, which apparently contains three ideas, namely impossibility, identity that is sameness and being, right? So it is impossible for the same thing, that's not really, that's just a placeholder, it is impossible for the same thing both to be and not to be. If I know that from birth, then I must have the idea of impossibility, the idea of identity, and the idea of being from birth. Okay, there's a question in the chat. Can an innate principle be an operation? Um, well, so, uh, I mean, the short answer is no, <laughs> right? The short answer is no. Propositions are composed of ideas. Not, they're not operations. They're like relations between ideas. Of course, assenting to, considering, whatever, a proposition is an operation. So that's why that was the short answer is no, but the long answer is, it, I mean, to know a proposition means to, to have a certain power to, um, to be certain of its truth when I want to, when it comes up. Right, and that would be an operation. But the principle itself is just, you know, what would be the object of that operation if I had it or something like that? Is that? He doesn't say a lot about the metaphysical details about what propositions are, like where they fit in that picture. But yeah, okay. So, um, but you certainly can't carry out the operation of entertaining the proposition unless you can carry out the operations of perceiving the ideas, entertaining the ideas that are in it, thinking the ideas that are in it. Um, and he says, look, do you really think babies are born with the notion of impossibility, being, and identity? On the contrary, those are really hard ideas, very abstract says a lot of grown people don't have them properly, probably. They're not easy ideas to form. They're certainly not innate. Are there any innate ideas? Well, he says maybe like there's an idea of warmth or hunger or something like that, that a baby is born with. Um, I mean, that just means it's not really an exception to its rule. It really just means it got it from prenatal experience, right? It acquired it in the womb. But in any case, be that as it may, that's if there are any innate ideas, they're like that, he says. They're not the type of ideas that would be needed for innate principles. Okay, so how do we know that? 
this brings me back to the question, what is an innate principle? So an innate principle is a kind of proposition, not a kind of idea, but it's not just any innate proposition. It's supposed to be a kind of innate proposition known for birth, from birth that can serve as the foundation of our knowledge. Right, so that's what principle means here basically, right? Principium means beginning, like first thing in Latin. So a principle, I mean, you could call these innate first principles. But what I'm saying is that first principle is actually redundant, right? Princi principle actually means first, <laughs> right? So these are supposed to be innate first propositions that would serve as a foundation for everything else, like the way people think the axioms of mathematics work. In fact, some of these people at least say that the axioms of mathematics are innate principles. Locke doesn't think that's how mathematics works, we'll get to that later, but he, he definitely doesn't think that's how our knowledge in general works. But if it did, then of course, they would have to be very general fundamental truths, not something like, I want some milk now, <laughs> right? Um, the kind of proposition you might imagine, but it's probably, it's got to be even more particular and simple than that somehow, right? But some vague proposition that the baby entertains in terms of warmth and hunger and whatever, it's, we're, it's not going to be possible to deduce all our knowledge from that. I guess maybe according to a certain kind of quasi Freudian philosophy, it is possible, but Locke is not entertaining that possibility. Right. So we can't deduce all our, our, our knowledge from things like that. It would have to be things like, and these are the type of things that the proponents of innate principles would suggest. It is impossible for the same thing both to be and not to be. The whole is greater than the part. That's one of Euclid's axioms, um, um, things like that. And Locke says, we, we don't have those ideas innately. So we can't have entertain those propositions. We can't even think those propositions when we're born, let alone know them to be true. We don't have the ideas that make them up. Okay, I see there is only one minute left during which time I can't possibly make the rest of his argument. Um, um, I'll just say in that one minute, and I guess I'll say a little bit more about this at the beginning next time, that um, um, the main part of the argument has to do with whether there is universal consent to these supposed innate principles. So supposedly the people who hold this view would have to predict that all human beings always assent to these principles. How we get that result is the thing I don't have time to go into. It's not that clear. Why couldn't they be innate principles for some people and not for others? But anyway, so supposedly they have to um, predict that all human beings always know these principles. And then Locke says, well, not only do children not know these principles, but quote unquote idiots, that is, you know, cognitively or uh, intellectually disabled people don't ever come like severely this you know disabled don't ever come to know these principles and uh not only that but even perfectly um smart and able adults who never happen to think about this kind of abstruse subject um you know also never come to know these principles therefore they can't be innate And if you say, well, no, no, of course, I don't mean that we always know them. I mean, we always, everyone always has the capacity to know them. If you tell it to them, then they'll agree to it. Locke says, well, of course, people have the capacity to know them. 
People have the capacity to know everything that they're ever going to know. People have the capacity to know lots of things that they're never going to know. Right? Because they could have known it, but they just never happened to think about it or whatever, right? So if you're going to say that having the capacity to know it counts as making it innate, then you're going to have to say that all our knowledge is innate. And of course, he doesn't anticipate that Leibniz is going to say just that. <laughs> but most of his opponents would not, or all of his opponents would not want to say that. And so he thinks he has them there. Okay, like I said, I'll say a little bit more about that at the beginning next time, and I will see you then. Bye.